And now I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Cybersecurity Then and Now. I'm going to hand things over to our Cybersecurity Product Manager, Mr. Buck Chow. Thank you, Kelly. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. I'm Buck Chow, the Product Manager for Cybersecurity here at the New Horizons Corporate Office. And I'd also like to also welcome you to today's webinar. This is our fifth out of 10 cybersecurity focus webinars that New Horizons is hosting in the month of October. And if you're not aware, so October has been de designated as Cybersecurity Awareness Month by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this is an annual campaign now in its 15th year uh, with a goal of raising awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month is a collaborative effort between the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and as public and private partners, including the National Cybersecurity Alliance, to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity and individual cyber hygiene. New Horizons Cybersecurity Awareness Month is now in our third year as an annual focus month, and the goal of our webinars, done in conjunction with our industry partners, is to provide you with a better understanding of how to stay safer online with input from subject matter experts to help enhance your organization's cyber resilience and overall cybersecurity posture. Uh, you can find a cybersecurity awareness landing page at your local New Horizons website. So you can find by going to newhorizons.com, clicking on find a location, and you'll see a cybersecurity awareness month uh, campaigns under promotions where you can find a full list of upcoming cybersecurity webinars that we have. Uh, there's five more coming. We've done five already. Uh, this is the fifth one. Uh, you can find the recordings along with free downloadable cybersecurity resources. These 10 cybersecurity webinars that New Horizons is hosting this month cover different aspects about today's ever-evolving cyber threat landscape. Today's webinar, Cybersecurity Then and Now, we're going to discuss how cybersecurity threats continue to evolve and how it's more critical than ever that your cybersecurity defenses meet the requirements of today and those of the future. Our presenter is Chris Kesselberg, a security engineer and instructor with Cloud Harmonics. Cloud Harmonics is a New Horizons partner. Chris, having been on the front line of security for seven years, has a keen insight in how the landscape has changed. And uh, take it away, Chris. Hey, thanks for that, Buck. And uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for jumping on the, the call with us today. I'm glad to be here and really glad to just have some time to talk about uh, cybersecurity in general. Uh, I am very lucky to be able to work in a career field that I love. I actually switched to come here. Uh, because I like security so much, uh, and both offensive and defensive. Uh, as Buck said, I, I have about seven years of experience. I work with both uh, blue team and red team scenarios. So I do uh, perform penetration tests, uh, and, and I do assist in, in consulting a lot of our end user customers uh, on how they can better not only implement security systems, but you know, what are the things they should look for as they continue to grow as a company? So today's, uh, today's call, what we're gonna be walking through is specifically what's changed in the last five years and, and how do we expect that to uh, kind of give us information for the next five years of what's gonna happen. We're gonna talk about the landscape of security, um, it's in a constantly evolving state. It's never static. We never get the ability to just say, all right, I think, I think I'm think i secure enough at this point. That That's never something that we can say. Uh, and that's, that's okay. Um, it, it's a reality of the world we live in. So we need to understand how can we effectively provide security to our companies, to our customers' companies, whoever it is that we're interacting with at the end of the day. And there's a lot of implications that go in with that. Uh, but what we're going to talk about in, in this case is we're, we're going to keep it pretty broad. Um, I want to take a look at throughput and growth requirements, how that's affected uh, the requirements for data interpretation or analysis at the network level and what kind of impact uh, that really means for hardware in your environment or maybe virtual solutions as well. Uh, and then I wanna definitely take a look at the Palo Alto Network's security platform. And the reason 
uh, we work with Palo Alto Networks so often is because they, they fundamentally approach the problem of security in a different fashion than most organizations out there. A lot of organizations in security today were in networking 10, 15 years ago, right? Palo Alto didn't exist then. They were a company founded specifically on the principles of providing the best in class enterprise level security and it shows in their product. So we're going to take a high level look at the next generation firewall, um, the components of app ID, content ID, user ID, and how that really increases not only our visibility, but ultimately how we can control uh, what occurs in our environments. We also need to talk a little bit about encryption and of course decryption as well. Uh, this is something that you're going to encounter no matter where you are uh, and, and whether you think about it or not. Uh, encryption does provide a lot of good things for us, secure communication streams, right? We get validation of who people are on the, on the internet when we're sending data. Um, there, there's a lot of great fundamental uh, principles that, that come out of using encryption. And that's, that's wonderful, but in security, we're all about gaining visibility. And we don't want to limit that visibility in any way. Um, so we're going to take a look at what it really means to have something uh, encrypted or what it means to have, you know, SSL or TLS on your servers. And then why decryption is actually really important uh, for a lot of what we do in security engineering and analysis in terms of trying to find out what's actually going on in our networks. Then I want to transition over to the endpoint, right? And we're going to take a look at a, an attack that occurred last year. It was a pretty prominent um, ransomware attack that hit a lot of organizations around the globe, uh, both the United States, uh, some the Ukrainian government, um, and that's it's the WannaCry, WannaCryptor attack. Um, we're going to want to look at what it did and then ultimately, you know, who were the companies that were successful in preventing these attacks? Why were they uh, successful in that? And we want to see how uh, Palo Alto's solution uh, with their traps uh, endpoint protection can actually handle some of that uh, for us as well into the future when we see the next big wave of these. So, all right, that's just a little introduction, but I'd like to just go ahead and, and dive right in here. Now, when I say something like the security landscape has changed. I just want to reiterate that it's it's never really at a static or non-moving state. It's constantly evolving. We build better mousetraps, we build better security controls, we build better analysis. We have all the information in the world at, the, at, at this point. In 2018, I can give you more data than you would ever be able to do anything with. And that's actually causing problems in a lot of scenarios. In, in real world scenarios, we have limited resources. I don't have infinite team members. I don't have infinite bodies to come in and do the work at the end of the day. So we have to be able to prioritize effectively what we're going to take care of because there's always another alert. There's always going to be another um, you know, compliance audit. There's always something that never changes. Beyond that, we've got attackers, both, we, we've got everything from script kitties, we've got um, you know, professional criminal organizations, we've got nation state entities. Um, you know, we continue to see year over year uh, that the battle on the internet just grows and grows. In, in the ransomware attack that we're gonna look at, they're using exploits that were stolen from the United States government right? and then published on the internet. So uh, this is the reality of the world that we live in. Cyber warfare is real. It's not going anywhere. And, and I know that sounds ominous and scary. It's a reality. That's the world that we live in right now. So um, beyond that, let's talk about some good things. Let's talk about companies succeeding. Your company is successful year over year. You continue to do well in business. You continue to branch out. Your company is going to grow. You're going to hire more employees, right? Maybe you open another branch office, or maybe 
you have uh, an idea for a new application, you want to start moving things to uh, a cloud environment or a hybrid environment. All of these things, we have to start processing more data. The more users we have, the more applications they're accessing, our bandwidth is growing year over year, right? Five years ago, it was really common to go look into a lot of networks and see one meg connections. On a corporate, a corporate, I, I worked with Fortune 500 companies that had one megabit internet connections for their entire headquarters office. Now, I would be very surprised if you know a company like that didn't have one gig or 10 gig. Right? That's the, the trend that we continue to see. So with that increase in bandwidth, just the pure amount of data, that puts a tax on our devices that are sitting on our network that are capturing this data, that are looking at it, that are giving us information about attacks. So we've got to be mindful of what that really means for the size of our networks. Now I have access to devices. I can put them in virtual environments. I have hardware available to me. I can support not just virtual, but cloud, you know, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud. Um, th there's all kinds of options. So when we think about this, we've got to give a little bit more consideration into what is the next five years of growth going to look like when we start purchasing both, you know, network infrastructure and any kind of IT infrastructure. Right. Sorry, I'm going to take a sip of my drink there. But throughput is a big concern. And it only gets compounded the more data that we put through here. When we add something like encryption, or decryption to the mix, or proxying traffic in any way, or you know, the more analysis you do. That's the challenges that you really see in a lot of uh, security solutions, network solutions, or, or that are out there. I'm not going to name names. I don't want to badmouth anybody. But when you when you have a solution and it's adding latency to that traffic and you keep adding users and you keep growing right you can start to see how this idea does not scale over time eventually something's going to break and that can be catastrophic for any company right i've seen you know you you hear companies uh, or stories about companies you can go look and if their internet's down for an hour they're losing a million dollars that's insane uh, but that, again, you know, when we get into financial services companies, banks, uh, people that process any kind of transactions, these systems are up 365 days a year. They don't go down. So that's the kind of challenges that we're talking about. And, and if that's the critical infrastructure that you're trying to sustain, right, that's your revenue gaining infrastructure, you definitely want to be mindful of adding all of this year over year. Uh, eventually, as I said, something's got to give there. So we've got to be mindful of that as we continue to grow. All right. Now, I want to introduce the Palo Alto Network security platform. Now, notice I didn't say just their next generation firewall or their traps endpoint solution. I said security platform. And that's truly what it is, what they've built. They did start out as a next generation firewall company. They're very, very successful with that because at a base level, their principles where we want to provide enterprise security and we want to engineer a solution from the ground up that has that one focus in mind. So whereas other solutions are adding latency or I've got to buy multiple different uh, solutions to do different functionalities, Palo Alto's uh, principle on that is we want to do all all of that heavy lifting on one device here and that's the next generation firewall that's what that's what we're doing here and we have visibility in a in a way that we never had before right in a world even when we talk about things like uh, I, I don't know if anybody's familiar with utm devices unified threat management or before that you know just looking at uh, a layer one to four firewall with an access control list in terms of visibility what can i see on a network it's tenfold of what we had uh, five years ago, much less, you know, 10, 20. Uh, the reality is we can see pretty much everything at this point, right? There, there's, there's not a whole lot of things that can't be intercepted uh, and seen in, in 
any environment. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we need more context to the information that I'm getting. It's no longer effective for my security analyst to go look at alerts and just see IPs coming back at them. Right? I wanna know whose computer that is immediately and I have to go look that up. Uh, maybe I've gotta go use the, the device management system our company uses or uh, you know, there's a directory. Right? And then I want to look at what IP they're going out to access. Okay, well, now I've got to go type in domain tools. I've got to go look up this address, see what kind of history they have. Right? And this is me just beginning my process. This is the typical process that I would take if I'm investigating an alert as an analyst. You, this over time, it, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of alerts. Uh, again, nobody has enough staff to go through the amount of data that they're getting. So we need that data prioritized. And that's what Palo Alto's visibility gives us. Instead of looking at IPs, we can start looking at App ID, right? What App ID does for us is it gives us a lot more contextual information, right? Now, instead of going to 10.10.10.10, uh, .10 I see that I've got users going to Facebook. They're going to YouTube. Uh, they're accessing Office 365. Um, you know, I've got somebody using Putty. I've got somebody using a torrent client to download files for free on the company internet. Right? That is what I mean about contextual information and visibility. That's a lot more information than just a couple of IP addresses that I've got to go research, right? Now, some of these applications, they do tend to try to hide their information through encrypted tunnels, whether it be SSL, TLS, whatever that may be. Um, and that's where we're gonna talk about encryption in a couple slides here, but we'll, we'll wait to get to that. So our first principle is app ID, and this is our visibility piece. Uh, we can then take this information and start using it in our policies. So I could create blacklists, whitelists, I could group these together. We could say, I want to, um, you know, block Facebook as a whole. Maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I just want to block uh, the ability to post messages on Facebook. Or maybe I don't want to allow users to play Facebook games, but they can browse it. Right? These are some of the options that we start getting into uh, when we, we have app ID, when we can start controlling these little individual aspects of applications as well, which is really, really cool. The next step, is going to be threat prevention, right? And that's that's called content ID in the next generation firewall. So content ID looks at that same application traffic, and now it says, okay, within that Facebook traffic, within that Google Drive traffic, I want to analyze all of these packets and see if there's any viruses, any spyware. Um, I want to see if there's a vulnerability, uh, maybe, you know, Maybe we do have an asset protected, but it's still got a vulnerability. If something else were compromised internally, it could be accessed. Well, if I have my next generation firewall and I have these signatures, I can stop that in transit before it does reach my server. That's a reality of the world that we live in, right? Patch management cycles, uh, you know, things being just up to date, up to date. People have QA teams, people, still have fear from the old Microsoft days. Microsoft burned people. They released patches that broke critical infrastructure and people still feel bad about that, you know, 20 years later, 10 years later. It's it's not just one time that it's happened. So I, I get the complaints. I understand the complaints from infrastructure teams when they say, you know, I, I can't just blindly release a Microsoft patch. And I, I don't think you should either. I believe in the cyclical process. I believe in QA and testing things before you go put them into production. It causes a lot less errors and it, it, it causes a lot less stress for everybody involved at the end of the day. Now, beyond that, we, we've got to still be able to secure assets, right? And so when I start segmenting things based on maybe you know, VLAN in the network, or I could group together, uh, you know, we could say I've got a VLAN for IT ops, I've got a VLAN for the sales department, I've got a VLAN for um, security servers, for 
uh, production servers, for dev, right? all of these different options. This is how we start segmenting the network and controlling with policy. So now when I have a segmented network, I can see this vulnerability in transit and I can stop it. I can prevent or at least contain damage if any of my other security controls fail. And that's very powerful. Now, the last key principle here is user ID. And what user ID does is it brings accountability to actions in the environment. Instead of saying, oh, hey, that traffic came from 10.10.10.10. Uh, .10 now I see, oh, hey, that's, uh, that's Jim in accounting. Uh, he's going to Facebook right now. Uh, oh, Susie over in IT ops, she's using Putty to manage a server. Uh, Chuck over in you know, HR, he is uh, accessing Office 365. Right. That's the, this is the picture being built. So now I have complete control and complete visibility. And the best part is all of this information that we've said we can now see, we can also use this in our policies and control things. So I can create policies for specific users or user groups. And now I can say, all right, maybe the sales team needs access to Facebook posting everybody else really only needs access to browse it and maybe we put some time control restraints around that as well um you know i don't want to allow anybody access to torrent things on the company internet right? that's a waste of bandwidth so we're just going to block that outright um and i want to uh, maybe control what users urls they're visiting so we want to put some url filtration we've got advanced threat detection in the form of wildfire right? this is these are all the things that we can add as in, in terms of visit, adding to that visibility and, and threat detection at the end of the day. All right, so I said I was gonna talk a little bit about encryption. Now, encryption is, as I stated before, a good thing. In a lot of scenarios, it really does help us, right? It creates secure communication streams, we can use encryption to secure actual assets, and by assets, I mean documents, uh, files, some sort. Uh, but there's some caveats to understanding a lot about encryption. Now, first thing is, let's talk about SSL TLS. Just because my server is using SSL or TLS, that does not inherently mean that that uh, server is secure or safe. That is not a one-to-one -one relationship at all. Um, what it means is that users who communicate with that server, no matter who they are, will have a secure communication stream, and that's been validated. That's all that SSL and TLS really means. Well, why am I saying this? Because within, we, we still wanna be able to look at the data inside that secure communication stream. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of the most popular is data exfiltration, right? Corporate espionage, again, another nasty reality of the world that we live in. Uh, sales team, sale, you know, disgruntled employee, doesn't like the compensation he's getting at company A, so he positions himself to market at company B and says, hey, if you hire me, I'll bring over the client list to company B. Now. Just for the record, guys, that's against the law in a lot of cases. You probably sign NDAs or other agreements with your companies. There's been lawsuits about this. Uh, you can go watch some of the DEF CON forensic videos and get a couple laughs about some of these instances where uh, they brought in security experts uh, and expert witnesses such as myself uh, to come look at these guys' hard drives and computers after the fact. Just, a, a, again, an iteration everything can be seen at this point. Uh, and it, it's, it's there, there's not a whole lot that can't be seen. So um, on average, most enterprise networks at this point have anywhere from 40% of 60% of their total network traffic is encrypted. So what does that mean if I've been building this conversation about visibility this entire time and I can't look at a huge chunk of it? That's a, that's a big issue for me. So what are my options, right? I've, I've got to go to decryption in some form, at least for certain traffic, right? I want to be able to, uh, I want to be able to decrypt, decrypt my users outbound going traffic 
unless you know it's something like a, a sensitive information site. Typically, the best practice that we recommend is you decrypt everything except for healthcare, government, and financial services websites. Everything else is game uh, as soon as you signed your acceptable use agreement to work for the company. So uh, that's typically the best practice that we, we implement in terms of what kind of decryption policies should I have. There's no need for anybody to have that information. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to interrupt the benefits that our users gain from encryption, right? Beyond that, our security teams also need to see the incoming web requests if our company has any kind of a public facing web presence. Now, the reason that this is important is again, because all we have is a secure communication stream. So myself, I could be an attacker. I connect to your web server. Guess what? I can still attack it, right? <laughs> I'm just doing it in a secure communication stream now, if that makes sense. So I've got to be able, as an analyst, as an engineer, I've got to be able to go look inside the packets that are being sent to our web servers, because I want to make sure people aren't attempting things like uh, buffer overflow attacks, SQL injection, uh, any, any kind of web application penetration testing that we would use. Uh, there, there's, there's types of ways for us to relay individual packets so I can see every single response that comes from your server, right? And, you know, a lot of web servers have ways to hide this information, but you know, you go work in a new environment, you get a new job, you get a team that's young, uh, you're going to, you're going to encounter uh, situations where it not, if, you know, maybe in your own environment, you've already seen it. So again, we've got to be able to decrypt and look at the incoming and the outgoing. Right? So what are our options in terms of decryption as of today? Well, I can go out and I can purchase a decryption proxy. We would call this a point solution, meaning I go find a vendor that sells decryption proxies and I buy it just for this one purpose, right? And all this box is going to do is sit inside my environment, decrypt traffic. Now, the downside to using a decryption proxy is, again, we're going to go back to that conversation of latency and scaling. So number one, decrypting anything is extremely extremely hardware intensive, RAM and CPU. Uh, no matter what you're doing, I worked a lot, with, I still work a lot with cryptocurrency uh, and I, I, I promise you it's very, very hardware intensive, even in terms of, uh, you know, smaller encryption streams, smaller hashing algorithms that are used. <coughs> No matter what, anytime you're intercepting and man in the middling any session, it's going to increase the hardware that it takes. So what does that mean for us when we talk about throughput, growth, uh, sizing for the future, and thinking about all these things? It means that, again, a decryption proxy is not going to scale effectively into the future. It's not going to work. And the reason for that is because if we logically think about this, my traffic comes in from the Internet it hits my decryption proxy. My decryption proxy then has to decrypt it, and then it sends it to my next generation firewall. Once my next generation firewall figures out what to do with it, it's gonna send it back to the decryption proxy, right? And then the decryption proxy is gonna re-encrypt it and send it on to our destination. Instead of all of that, I could just size my next generation firewall up higher from the beginning, because in Palo Alto's case, they have specifically used processors that we call FPGAs. Right. Now, an FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And I know that sounds really techy and really confusing, so don't stress, uh, because I feel that way as well. Uh, what it essentially means is that these processors were written at a very base level, a, a, a programmatically defined to do specific jobs, right? In this case, they're programmatically defined to uh, decrypt traffic, right? So, uh, they are programmatically designed to perform analysis. So signature matching, hash matching, um, you know, regular expression matching well, at, at, at lightning speed. Uh, and so we can do all of this functionality still on the same device. I don't have to go buy 
a solution and try and integrate it and then worry about you know how does this how does this work three years down the road five years down the road right what happens if this company goes under or gets bought out right? i'm kind of up the creek at that point so in this case we we definitely recommend looking at just again size up from the beginning give yourself room for growth consider things like decryption from the start and you'll be ahead of the game when you come look at it three five seven ten years down the road okay now i'm going to transition over to talking a little bit about endpoints and i want to talk specifically about an attack that occurred last year and this attack was the wanna cry or wanna crypto attack and there's two parts of this the first one was an smb worm smb stands for server message block very very quickly it's the way that windows servers communicate with each other right uh, what this vulnerability allowed the attackers to do was infiltrate one system and then propagate essentially a backdoor to every other system with the vulnerability in an environment. And it did so silently. At the point in time that this attack occurred, there was a published patch for the vulnerability. So again, we could get down a rabbit hole about patch management and that culture and, and what we should be focused on. Um, we're not gonna do that today, but it is a point of validation that you should you know, always be working to better that process. So this, this worm was actually a piece of code uh, that was delivered in the shadow brokers leak uh, that happened, I think, six months before the attack. And basically, you know, it was published to the internet. Uh, we got a bunch access to a bunch of CIA and NSA uh, hacking tools that were published, uh, and they're very effective. I still use many of them today in penetration tests. They are still very very effective uh, so this smb worm spreads through the network and then once it can't anymore it kicks in the ransomware piece right? and the ransomware piece is it downloads a very small executable on your computer with directions to delete all of your local backups and then encrypt every file on your computer and then it elevates uh, actually elevates its privileges and reboots so that you can even after reboot it's persistent uh the ransom note is still there uh and they have complete control over your machine that's very very damaging attack just to give you guys an idea we've talked about decryption and I, instead of work with cryptocurrency um these your, your files are getting encrypted with aes 256 all right so uh mathematically with all of the computing power in the world together it would still take us something like 300 years to brute force one sha 256 hash or aes 256. Uh, so the reality of us breaking into that and getting any kind of data recovery uh is is slim to none there is a possibility that we would luck on it by chance but the reality is that will never happen the only option for recovery uh, is if an organization like Interpol or, um, you know, the FBI is pretty prominent in these cases, uh, working with Interpol outside of the United States to uh, shut down these servers and obtain the private keys. Right? If they do obtain the private keys and they publish them, uh, the decryption process can occur. You can do a lot of data recovery. Uh, but from just to give you an idea of that, I know of an enterprise company in a uh, Dallas, Texas, that got hit uh, by this attack, and uh, I, they're still trying to figure out the the full scope of the damages to this day. So, there's the the data recovery process is very long and tedious. The real reality is that you you don't ever want to deal with this. Uh, I, I promise you, you don't want to deal with ransomware in your network. It is catastrophic. And it's not going to be fun for a long time if this if something like this happens in your environment. All right, um, we'll come back to that here in a second. Before that, I want to actually take a look at the trap solution versus this WannaCry attack. Now, traps is Palo Alto Network's endpoint solution, and what this is, it has been uh, certified by the PCI Council as an antivirus replacement. It is not a traditional signature-based antivirus. 
Uh, it is focused on the success that Palo Alto has had in their wildfire threat detection cloud. They've taken the technology there and they've added other technology to it and they've made a extremely powerful uh, endpoint security solution. All right, so this trap solution, there's two things that it focuses on. It focuses on blocking exploits, right? So direct exploitation of an endpoint, whether that's me exploiting an application or a hardware or excuse me, a software vulnerability, um, you, you know, something along those lines or, and then on the other token, it also blocks against uh, malware, right? So me getting you to click on a link and download a piece of software or maybe even a phishing link. I get you to click a link and uh, it looks like a safe web server. Well, maybe we want some, you know, we want to prevent our users from submitting their credentials there. We can do phishing prevention uh, at the firewall level and now at the endpoint level as well. So when we're focused on the exploitation techniques rather than creating another signature, right? It's much more effective in blocking uh, malicious behavior and attacks. Because here's the reality, guys. If you're not familiar with penetration testing, if you're not familiar with hacking, the exploitation techniques themselves, we don't really come up with a whole lot of new ones, right? They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty kind of set in stone. There's, there's about 20 to 30, but there's not a whole lot of new techniques that come out year over year. Whereas there's billions and billions and billions of new malware variants every year. Right. So companies that are still out there trying to block the newest variant, they're, again, fundamentally approaching the problem <laughs> the wrong way. You want to look for the behavior. When we look for the behavior, we have a much more effective ratio and we have a what, way lower uh, false positive ratio. That's what we're looking for. Effective data, right? effective information at the end of the day. All right, so let's take a look at what traps is can do uh, versus this wanna cry scenario. Now, again, there's an SMB worm uh, previously patched by Microsoft um, and they exploit this SMB uh, vulnerability. Once it's on the machine, it's going to attempt to elevate its privileges and elevate itself to uh, user NT slash system, uh, depending on what environment you are. Um, when it's elevated to system, it has the, the attack has more power uh, than the actual user sitting down. And most administrators in a lot of cases uh, it can create registry keys. It can affect the boot sector of the hard drive, which it does. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of capabilities. But the real thing that it does is spread its propagation tool, and that's called double pulsar. That double pulsar tool scans the rest of the network and it propagates that worm to every other host in the network that has that same vulnerability. Which chances are, if you haven't patched it on one, you probably haven't patched it on a lot of machines, all right? Then once it has propagated itself, when it can no longer spread, it kicks in the ransomware process. All right, so we're actually gonna, I'm gonna open this up here, and we're gonna talk about all of these as a whole. But we're gonna start backwards, uh, we're going to go latest to earliest. Yeah. All right. So for the malware piece itself or the ransomware piece itself, this is an executable that actually gets downloaded to your endpoint, right? Separate from the SMB worm. So this executable is a file. It's a binary that we can analyze, right? And that gives us a lot of power. We have a lot of analysis with traps running locally on the endpoint. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we wanna check this local analysis, right? What does this local analysis mean? Well, in the wildfire threat cloud that we submit files from our next generation firewall to, uh, we use machine learning to look at characteristics of files and traits that typically uh, make them malicious, right? And it gives us a rating. A copy of that machine learning algorithm that has been trained over uh, billions of files at this point over the last five to 10 years. Uh, a copy of that is stored locally uh, with the traps agent. So it can do local feature analysis and it's extremely quick. It takes, uh, you know, 
less than a minute in a lot of cases, it's seconds in most cases to analyze one file. Now beyond that, it's not going to stop at local analysis. It's also going to do dynamic analysis, which means submit a copy up to uh, the active cloud so that it can do further testing in a wider array of environments, right? To see if it's maybe malicious, not in you know, the scenario that it got downloaded in, but maybe it's malicious for other assets that we have in our environment and we still want to prevent that. Now, if there's any kind of threat intelligence, in this case, there was not, but had there been, uh, we would have detected that. The wildfire threat intelligence that gets pushed by uh, Palo Alto, if you are a wildfire subscriber, uh, you can get any new signature after it's created, gets pushed down within uh, actually up to 60 seconds, I think now. Okay. And then the last portion is a module specifically dedicated to ransomware protection and the behavior of ransomware. Ransomware is very particular in the way that it operates, right? And it follows a pattern. Install itself, delete your backups, encrypt files. Just for the record, there's not very many legitimate programs out there that follow that direct order or any order close to that uh, in terms of, of being a useful or relevant application. So that's a pretty common behavior pattern that we can look for and analyze in this scenario for detection. So lots of facets just to that ransomware. And again, we wanna stop this stuff before we have to deal with remediation and detection and incident response. I wanna stop it before it ever does anything. So let's go a step back. When this SMB worm was on the endpoint, right, we actually have modules to prevent the functionality that it causes here. So I said that it, it gains kernel level privileges. Well, there's a kernel exploitation module. Normal users in your environment never, ever, need to elevate to system level authority on a computer, right? We have user accounts and user names for a reason. We give you permission to what you need to do. So again, a pretty, pretty specific behavior that we can look for. Legitimate applications. The only time they might ever need to run a system, unless it's like a, a security control of some sort, is typically during the installation process. And even then, they don't usually run a system, they usually just run as administrator. So not fully elevated to what we would call the kernel level. And then beyond that, let's say we didn't have the kernel exploit prevention. Another common behavior is child processes. Right? So malware typically when it uh, is initially uh, downloaded or, or instantiated on your endpoint, meaning you clicked on it, uh, what it will do is it will hide itself in an existing process like Outlook or Google Chrome, and then it'll spawn malicious child processes off of that. Again, a very specific action we can look for. In this case, that's an exploitation technique uh, called child processes. Most legitimate applications do not do this. Uh, if they do, uh, you should reevaluate your development strategies a little bit there. But, you know, there are valid reasons for it. It's just that most legitimate applications don't need to do that because they have no problem registering and showing you what they're doing. Right. So uh, this is how Traps is, is really going to bring us through on preventing zero days. The next unheard of attack. What's waiting around the corner, you know, a week from now, two weeks from now a month. Right. Again, this is not going to stop. This is not going to go anywhere. This is um, kind of the future for us here. All right, just taking a look really quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time here. Palo Alto does have a wide range of uh, security controls. These are the next generation firewalls we're looking at here, ranging in size from supporting everything from a Soho, small office, home office, or branch environment, all the way up to a data center level. I do have a PA220 at my house. I use it here for a lot of testing, policy creation, and validation, and I, I love it. It's an excellent device. So beyond that, virtual capabilities as well. This is supported in VMware, NSX, and ESXi. It's supported in Citrix. Uh, uh, what am I thinking? Uh, Nutanix, Acropolis, Hypervisor, KVM, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, AWS, 
I might be missing one or two in there, but I think I got I think I got the majority of them. Uh, pretty much every uh, environment that the major environment for virtualization out there, and ranging in speeds of threat prevention. Again, I don't typically go by this because I assume that if you're going to purchase a network security control, uh, you're going to turn the network security preventions on on the device. So uh, we're going from 100 meg all the way up to 10 gig. Uh, in terms of threat prevention throughput. So that's throughput with all of that analysis, app ID, content ID, user ID. All right, so again, that's something to consider when we think about the future. Beyond that, training. Uh, Palo Alto themselves has a huge platform for training. They have a full uh, engineering certification platform uh, and, and they have introductory level platforms as well. Uh, in, in, intermediate search certifications, a, a full platform of getting familiar and becoming familiar with a, a wider range of products. They've got some really, really cool stuff coming down the pipeline in terms of what they're doing uh, to even more effectively use machine learning to prioritize um, contextual information from users, depending on uh, their, habit, their habits in the workplace, their routines. So very, very powerful stuff. They're kind of pioneering that. Nobody else is doing that. And these are very powerful devices. They're going to require training. Once you come familiar with it, it's very, it's, it's a great platform to work on. Uh, so the three levels of training, kind of taking a look at that, there is UTD and awareness. UTD stands for ultimate test drive. Uh, these are typically about uh, two to four hour classes that involve uh, just a quick introduction to one of the aspects of the platform, whether it be uh, their CASB solution, Aperture, or uh, importing uh, other threat feeds, uh, excuse me, threat feeds through something like autofocus. Uh, there's a lot of options there. Then we have foundations level training. These are typically one day courses where you have the capability to get firsthand with the firewall and uh, jump in here and, and be able to, uh, to to work around with things, all right? And then again, certification level training would be full day or up to week-long classes when you're going towards a, a professional level certification. This would be the equivalent of something like a Cisco network professional uh, certification out there. Uh, a little, little bit tougher than like a CCNA, so you want to have uh, probably at least six months to a year experience uh, and taken some of the trainings or majority of them before you go for uh, the PCNSC. Right. Uh, I, we can pull more information out of this, guys, but I'm running out of time and I want to make sure that we uh, open this up for everyone else out of here. So first things first, I would like to say thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Happy to be here and be able to talk to you guys about security. But I would like to open up the floor at this time and uh, uh, open it up for any questions, and I'm also going to pass it up um, back to our, our team here at New Horizons and thank them for letting me come talk today. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, really appreciate you coming and speaking about Palo Alto Networks and training. Um, I want to let everyone know I received a few questions already. Uh, we will be sending you all the recording link later today, so in case you want to go back and review anything, um, you'll be able to do that later today, so you should receive an email from me. Um, just want to thank you guys for attending our Security Then and Now webinar and hope you've gained some insight into what Palo Alto Networks has to offer through its comprehensive security platform and how training is the key to success. Um, if you log on to our website at newhorizons.com and search uh, Palo Alto training, you'll find all of um, the training options available. You can also contact your local New Horizons Center. Um, and if you aren't familiar with who your local New Horizons Center is, just go on to newhorizons.com and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. And Chris, we do have a couple questions that have come through. Uh, the first one, is there a good starting point or a guide to follow for learning Palo Alto products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll actually post a link here. Um, give me one second and I'll, I'll, I'll post a link. It's paloaltonetworks.csod.com. And that it will take you to their LMS system, their learning system. If you create an account, you don't have to be a customer to create an account on here. There are free trainings and they actually have a uh, training track um, and it'll break it out for you. So you'll be able to look at things like next generation firewall professional or uh, traps endpoint 
or cloud data center. They've got tracks individually for each one of those so that you can kind of specialize and take a look at that stuff. And then you'll see uh, the more professional certifications like the PCNSC on there as well. So uh, let me type that out here real quick. Um, Actually, one second. So, can you share that out um, with yeah. them, Kelly? Let me see. Okay. I just didn't see an option to send to everyone. I'm sorry. Yeah, and you know what? I don't have that either. So I'll go ahead and just include it in the email that I send to everyone. Perfect. The, That's... Um, yeah, later today with the recording, we'll do that. Right. Absolutely. And then just a, a side note for other resources, if you're just looking for quick tidbits or kind of want to get in, in, you know, or just a rundown on some of the other platforms, check out their YouTube channel. They have a really, really cool lightboard series that gives uh, quick, you know, five to 10 minute introductions, talks about things that I talked about today, things like decryption, um, some of their other solutions like Aperture or Autofocus. So definitely check that out, kind of play it in the background while you're on the side if you want. All right, and I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. So again, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us and speaking on behalf of uh, Palo Alto and Cloud Harmonics. Absolutely, thank you for having me, Kelly. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Hopefully, you guys will be able to join us for uh, the rest of our cybersecurity webinars we have for the rest of the month. So uh, be sure to go to newhorizons.com, click on the webinars link, and you can sign up for any upcoming sessions. Thanks so much, everyone. You may now log off. Have a great day.